Listen, there has never been a better time to invest in self-storage, and there's no better team than ours to show you how to do it because we wrote the book on how to invest in self-storage. Literally, we created the best-selling home study system titled How to Find, Evaluate, Purchase, and Manage Self-Storage Facilities. We have helped thousands of people launch and scale their self-storage business and have become the nation's go-to resource for all things self-storage. That's because we not only talk the talk, we walk the walk day in and day out since 2005 through now. Two recessions and amassing a 2.5 million square feet of self-storage, totaling over 15,000 doors nationwide. There is nobody else that has more experience in self-storage that is teaching people how to invest in self-storage. So if you're ready to launch and scale your self-storage business, then go to selfstorageinvesting.com. Click on the events tab to grab your ticket to the upcoming Self Storage Academy. So that again is selfstorageinvesting.com. Click on the events tab. Seating is limited. And on behalf of our team, we look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Take care. This is the Self Storage Podcast, where we share the knowledge and skills from the industry's leading investors, developers, and operators to help you launch and grow your self storage business. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and over the past 16 years, we have acquired, developed, converted, and syndicated over 2 million square feet of self storage nationwide with the help of my incredible team at selfstorageinvesting.com, who has helped thousands of people achieve greatness in self storage. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Self Storage Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and this week's guest is Dr. Ryan Smallers. Ryan is a consultant with a vast background in both medicine and business. He has a thriving otolaryngology practice in the Virgin Islands that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and has also recently filed a patent application for a new medication. Ryan also has partnerships in both an assisted living facility in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a holding company that invests solely in self-storage. He's also in an MBA program at the University of Miami and is due to graduate in December. Ryan is also a member of our self-storage mastermind, has been working on store token a social token on the blockchain that incentivizes customer loyalty and increases portfolio value by aligning the interest between the stakeholders, owners, and customers, which is the focus of this episode. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with my friend, Dr. Ryan Smallers. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing fantastic today. How about yourself? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me. Well, we've had a lot of conversations about the topic that we're going to be talking about today, and I thought it was best that we probably have you on, hit the record button, and let you in on the progress of the store token and what you've been working on. So I've given everybody a brief bio on yourself, your background, and a little bit about the store token and what that means for the storage industry. But what I'd like to do now is turn it over to you, have you fill in the gaps in terms of your journey, and then let's do a deep dive into the store token. That sounds great. So yeah, my professional career started out a little differently than most people in storage, I believe. So in 2010, I finished my residency in otolaryngology, ear, nose, and throat surgery. And the progression from there was basically surgery and medicine for the next seven years or so, trying to figure all that out and how exactly that was going to play out. And then in 2017, we had several very big storms that came through. And so that sort of changed my outlook on basically life in general and realized that at some point I was going to have to do a little bit more on the entrepreneur side, investing side. So the first thing I did was go back to MBA school in Miami and got my MBA and found you and started coming to the masterminds and some of the classes and some of those sorts of things I'd zero idea of what self-storage was or really investing, didn't know what a cap rate was, any of those sorts of things. So over the course of time, using your help and others became accustomed to talking about finances and economy and sort of macro and micro economics and things have sort of gone from there. And so through that journey, I decided probably closer to six months now that sort of take a step back a little bit from buying and selling storage facilities and really focus on some of the things that maybe other people wouldn't have interest in. And with that came cryptocurrency. And as my journey progressed, cryptocurrency sort of ecosystems and what that means and what blockchain technology means and all those sorts of things. And living in the Virgin Islands, I had a pretty good leg up on that sort of 
area of expertise because there's a lot of people down here that are involved in blockchain technology and have sort of access to teams of people and developers and some of these sorts of things that maybe other people don't have access to. And so really everything sort of spawned from there. We're developing a cryptocurrency on the blockchain. It's going to be on Cardano. We're about probably three-fourths of the way through phase one, and we can get into what all that entails and a little bit about what blockchain in general means. But basically, what everybody's trying to do in the space is take out the middlemen, take out the intermediaries, and be able to use a trustless system where you and I can do business. We don't have to trust each other. We just have to trust the platform that has performed historically very well. And so transparency is very key to that space where we want to make sure that everything is laid out. Everything's completely transparent. If you go back to the blockchain and a transaction happens, then you will be able to see that transaction on the blockchain and anyone can come and verify that that transaction has happened. So basically that has become central to this project is the transparency. Number one, number two is decentralization, which is a term that's kind of thrown around loosely in this day and age, but it has some meaning very near and dear to the people who are intricately involved in the blockchain space where over the course of history, most of the time when major decisions are made, it's usually made by one particular person in the highest level of the company or the country or whatever the case may be. This technology will allow people to have their say in the decision-making, but no one person makes to get has the ability to make that decision on their own. It's more like a voting process and a governance process. And interestingly enough, there are many facets that are happening in this type of technology where people are trying to build governments, there's also people trying to build companies on these decentralized philosophies, I call them DAX, decentralized autonomous corporations, or DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. There are already cities and counties going to this type of scenario where people can vote and do all the things that they want to do without having that centralized person making the decision. So the reason to be in blockchain is much different than what people think, where a lot of people that I've come in contact with or that think that cryptocurrency is an 18-year-old kid's game that where they're speculating on these tokens that may or may not have utility and value. When you talk to someone whose core values are very intricately involved in blockchain, then that's a whole different story of what that means to me and the people who are developing these products have very deep sort of views on decentralization and transparency. The two pieces, at least that I've been focusing on and what I'm most excited about, you've touched on. And first is to sum it up is removing the middleman. And I think for all of us, there's a little bit of joy that we find in that (laughs) because we know that in real estate transactions, there's a whole lot of folks that have their hand out, they get paid along the way. And not all of those folks, and I'm not just saying in my opinion, but in many people's opinions, really don't earn their fees, but they're necessary from regulation, from the natural course of business, because policy at the bank or at the title company has just required that you have to have all these things in place all along the way and all these fees. And when you look at a commercial real estate transaction, there are a whole lot of fees. I mean, our closing costs are a significant percentage of the transaction. And many of those, would I would argue, aren't always necessary. Now, some are in place for safety measures just because we have to have some oversight. But the every year you get as an investor, you recognize, ah, do I really have to pay, you know, this company for, you know, this piece of paper, you know, this document to back up when I've been at this for a while and I do my job a little bit better than some of these folks that I'm paying to have this piece of paper. So that excites me. But then also the piece with regards to, and I guess it dovetails into that, Ryan, and that is truly tokenizing real estate, being able to put together the funding in a decentralized manner where we don't have to have all of the oversight and we don't have to vet everybody that comes in because the protection is already built 
into the system because of the contract and the way that that works. And so I think it's pretty clear that we can clear out some of those fees in the transaction. But now let's kind of focus on the store token and what that looks like from a syndication standpoint, from raising private equity and how that differs from our traditional model right now of setting up a Reg D 506B or C and spending tens of thousands with the SEC and then making sure that you've dotted I's and crossed T's. Not that you shouldn't anyways, but you're being forced to do so and having to pay along the way in order to do so. So what looks different in Web 3.0 that we're heading into and the ability to do this in a different fashion? Yeah. So it's interesting. I think the best way to go about describing what store token is, is to basically go through the process of the different phases and what we're trying to do with the token. So with a token in general, Basically, what we're talking about here is a utility token, and there are really three main uh, things that you have to take into account with a, to make it under the category of a social token or utility token. One is, is there's a use case, and that takes a lot of these meme coins and some of those sorts of things out of the picture because a lot of them don't have a use case. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. But in our case, the use case is raising funds for sponsors or uh, developers undergoing self-storage projects to get the money quickly and efficiently. So in my mind, this token is set up in such a way where the transactions and the amount of money that goes to these sponsors comes very quickly and efficiently. And we can turn this over much faster than the traditional ways of doing things through a bank or otherwise, except for paying cash. And our goal with Store Token is to make the transaction as, as quick or quicker than someone paying cash, taking some of the middlemen out and these sorts of things. There is Store Token. The use case has been described. The second one is it's got to have a utility. And the utility for Store Token is to develop a rewards type system for self-storage in general. So in our mastermind is yours and we come together and everybody brings their deals and we talk about how to make our investing careers better and how to make our storage facilities better and that sort of thing. There's no real way to bring those facilities together and make it where we could take a customer from one of your facilities And if they are moving across the country and I have a facility somewhere else to have them have a reason incentive to go to that facility with store token, that makes it real easy because if we have a token available, we can make it such that if you know that that person is moving from Las Vegas to Florida, for example, and you have a facility in Las Vegas, you can tell the person, Hey, listen, we're running a deal. We have a store token powered facility in Florida, right where you're going. Let's call it Lakeland. And for moving your stuff into that facility that's also put together by store token, then we will give you a certain amount, an allocation of tokens. And with those tokens, you can stake them on the platform or use them to get a discount on that locker in Lakeland. So when they go to that other facility, they put their stuff there. Not only are they getting tokens for that, but you can make other reward system types of things such as pay in cash or pay six months in advance, a year in advance, and have a different allocation of tokens for those people to have that incentive. So that's number two. And then let's stop there and kind of take what we're doing with the token. So now that we've given the token to this client or person who's renting from us, what happens with that token? So right now in the development stage, we're going to launch this token in two different phases. Phase one is what we're working on right now. It's a speculative phase. So with the tokens, you can either buy them now pre-launch for a cheaper price than it will be post-launch. But once we are launched, what's called a TGE, token generating event, is where we make tokens and then they will be distributed. Someone who buys the token, there will be a platform, just like a website that you use today, except the difference is these newer website called Web 3.0 has the ability 
to have a wallet attached to that website. So it basically makes a website now completely financial where the amount of tokens that are in that wallet can be attached to that website and you can use them in that website. So instead of putting your credit card number into an Amazon platform or something like that, now you have your wallet of tokens, whether it be Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, store token, whatever the case may be, all of your tokens will be there. And on our Web3 platform, you will be able to stake those tokens, which means that from that wallet, they are moved over to the website and held in what's called a smart contract, where there are if-then statements, just like any other computer program, that tells that website what to do with those tokens. And the idea is, is that if you stake the tokens, those funds that are locked in that smart contract, we are able to use those funds to develop more of the Web3 platform to get to phase two. In return, that person that has those tokens that's locked in the smart contract, that is an investment for them. And so they are making on the phase one, probably around a 12% return on those tokens. Now, when we're setting all this up, that's very standard and we don't want to have too much of reward as we're seeing right now in the cryptocurrency markets. If you have too much of a reward for your investors, then it basically becomes a Ponzi scheme and you can't sustain that over the course of time. So we want everything to be sustainable, but we also want to give our investors or the people who are in the ecosystem, the store ecosystem, enough of a return to make it worth their while. So as we use those funds to develop the website, the idea is to, in phase two, to go ahead and be able to put different facilities on the website. And instead of staking them onto the platform for development, at that point, once it's developed, we'll be able to have those tokens locked into different facilities. So let's take, for instance, you have a facility in Georgia that you want to develop and let's say $12 million. And for the down payment, talk about a 70-30 LTV, that would be probably $3 million, I think, if we're using rough numbers. So with those tokens, if the conglomerate of people that hold the store token want to put those tokens into that facility, they will lock them in the smart contract. Everything will be transparent. They will be able to see their tokens at all time. They just won't be able to take them out because there'd be a hold period on those tokens. So you can watch your tokens being safe on the platform. And you can also tell exactly where we are in the process of your development. If you're ground up, you can see when the permits are obtained. You can see when the shovel hits the ground all the way up in these different stages, because once these areas have been completed, then you can hash them on the blockchain. Just like any other blockchain, you can see exactly what's happening. If you change that information on that blockchain, then you can tell that it's been changed. And so all of the documents, all of the things from the city, the permits, all of those will be completely transparent. The investor will be able to see them and there's no way to really hide anything. So that is sort of the nuts and bolts of what we're trying to do. Basically transparent, decentralized and fast, efficient money to these trusted people in the ecosystem to develop these facilities. Now, as we go along past phase two, there will be other phases. They just won't be as cut and dry as the others. We will move towards what we described earlier in this decentralized autonomous organization, where we will take the people who are making the decisions out of the equation slowly and basically put the people into those positions that the ecosystem wants. So once we develop governance, then we can develop the DAO and then the DAO can decide who they want making which decisions. And it may be this person makes the decisions for this and that person makes the decisions for that. It just really depends on the people that are in the ecosystem 
that are voting, that are keeping up with everything, what their wishes are. In the end, the consumer typically wins. And it looks like in this instance, we're finally getting to that place where we as investors and syndicators who have been so frustrated with the current system are finally getting an opportunity to make that happen. And nobody's trying to sidestep or skirt any issues, laws, or governance. We just want to rewrite the way that this works collectively because it is decentralized to say, here's what makes sense. The technology covers this portion. And so we don't have to have a whole lot of oversight and governance over here, but here's the area in which we need it. And we all understand and recognize that. So now let's pick the people and the processes and the policies to make sense, just so that we can have less friction in in commerce. I see a time and just moving ahead, Ryan, we're talking about commercial real estate right now, but we're talking about many, many transactions that are going to occur on Web 3.0 that are just going to have a lot less friction and are going to be so much easier. You can sell a house and transact a house online without ever coming into contact, just a single family, your own personal residence without having to go through a bank and then the list of three to four to seven other individuals and companies that are in place uh, right now. And that's because inherently it's built into the system and the safety and security is already there. So let's cut to in a perfect world. What does this look like for a self-storage investor putting your magic wand in your hand? So Ryan, as we're seeing this unfold, what can investors expect in terms of a rollout and a time frame of when they're going to see kind of a shift in the way we currently do business versus what things look like when these transactions begin to occur on a regular basis on the blockchain. Yeah. So one thing I can safely say is that our kids' kids, in my mind, won't understand what business hours are. So on a Sunday afternoon at six o'clock, if you want to close on a facility, by all means, you'll have the ways and the technology to do so. There won't be anybody that will have to be called or any of those sorts of things. Now, definitely are some parts of the process that are going to take longer than others. We as blockchain developers are very willing to put in the time and the effort to make the things happen. But on the other side of the coin, we're sort of stuck in the ways of what the city does or what the state does about making this information available and taking on this technology. So I think that there will be some parts of the country that will adopt it faster. And I think that once we have a few big cities that take this on and everything's on chain and we take out the intermediaries and that sort of thing, then it'll go a lot faster. But I've heard anywhere from five to 20 years, depending on those bottlenecks, A lot of the bottleneck is title. We're perfectly willing to make the system to have title come up through the blockchain, but do the cities and the states want that? And do they understand that they want it and why? So there's a lot of education that's going to go into these processes and trying to hash all of that out. Now, as far as the investors and the commercial real estate side, I mean, I can't tell you how many projects are out there that are developing. I would put it on the order of 500 to 1,000 teams right now that are trying to solve all these problems. And most of them are taking their each little niche sort of part of the commercial real estate world that they're most interested in trying to fix that one part. There are some projects that are trying to fix the whole thing which more power to them. I hope they have a really big team. (laughs) They have lots of funding to be able to do that. But I think that it's going to be a sort of a more stepwise process. In my mind, five years from now, commercial real estate transaction will look completely different. Do I think that we're going to be the whole way there in five years? I don't think so. I think that it just really depends on the adoption of this technology and basically the willingness of people to basically do it, the technology will certainly be there in five years. There's no doubt in my mind. It's more about the psychology of the people who are on the other side, who a lot of them make their living by being intermediaries. So it's going to be a tough sell. But as far as efficiency and transparency, we will be there sooner rather than later. So 
In order to not miss the boat, to keep informed outside of listening to the Self Storage Podcast and your repeat interviews and time here, where else can people kind of keep their ear to the ground so that everybody wants to be on the forefront of a technology, especially with the benefits that we just mentioned? What's the best way to kind of keep in tune with and understand when things are coming and when they need to be able to act? Yeah, so the place for store token in particular to find out the newest and greatest things going on in the platform is on the store token Discord. We recently put that together and trying to get that off the ground and trying to keep all the people involved up to date on what's going on. If people are interested more in finding out just about real estate and blockchain technology, there's groups of people, one in particular that's really good, it's called ReBlock. And they're trying to get the word out about just basically commercial real estate in general. I'm a part of that group. There's some phenomenal people. I've never really been in an asset class where people are begging people to come in and start building because everybody's saying we don't have enough people that even know about this particular side of commercial real estate where they're basically inviting anyone and everyone to get involved and do as much or as little as possible, and everybody's willing to help. There's just not enough groups out there to saturate the market because the area is just so wide open. But those are the two places I would say to start. And then we will try our best to keep everybody up informed and up to date on how everything's going and sort of the ins and outs of what the platform is going through. One caveat to that is that you mentioned earlier is the regulation. We are basically as an industry begging for regulation. We're saying, hey, we're over here. We're not going anywhere. We want you guys, if there's something that you feel like we need to do to make this a real asset class and to make people safe and our investors safe, then by all means, we're willing to do any and all of those things. Basically, you just have to tell us what we need to do. So that's where we are in, from that realm. So, And it sounds like the pendulum is starting to swing back with the people involved in the, in the space, going up to Washington, trying to educate everyone, telling them, look, we're not here to go against you. We want to do whatever you guys want us to do, but please tell us. So we don't want to get in trouble. We want to do what's best for the people, everyone involved. Well, I, for one, am extremely excited. As you know, Ryan, we've been having these conversations for the past couple of years in the mastermind and in outside conversations. And the team that you uh, built and continue to build is one that we are just excited and honored to be a part of. And so we're looking forward to having you back to explain to Storage Nation uh, the progress and to keep everybody at the forefront of what is going to be just an incredible run. And we are so excited for so many reasons at the thought of how we can, again, remove some of these uh, barriers, obstacles, and friction that's involved in, in transacting commercial real estate. So Ryan, I've got your information. We will put it in the show notes for everyone to be able to follow what's going on with uh, you and your endeavors, as well as on Reblock, as well as those that may be interested in spending more time with Ryan and uh, the rest of the incredible folks at the Mastermind as well. So Ryan, if you would, why don't you share maybe a book that you've been uh, reading recently or a book that you've uh, reread recently as we uh, head into a different economy that you might recommend uh, people picking up? Yeah. So this is a super interesting question. I'm glad you asked. I've been doing a lot of research recently into body language. And one of the people in the forefront of that is Joe Navarro. Basically, if you can get any of his books or lectures, or YouTube sort of thing, I've really started to realize that basically all these economies and the markets and all these sorts of stuff that we study really only depends on one thing, and it's human psychology. And it's basically psychological comfort. And so if you understand where people are coming from and how they're trying to soothe and try to feel comfortable, you will understand markets and Main Street, Wall Street, all these sorts of things so much better. And if you're at all interested in understanding what's going on in the, in the economy and why people are doing what they're doing and why things are going the way they're going, it all comes back to that. It all comes back to why, as a human, we do what we do. And so, in my mind, one of the, the really key insights into that is body language, because people can tell whatever they want to tell you, but the body never lies. 
So I've been super interested in that over the last couple of months and really diving into that. So I would highly encourage the audience to do so as well. Good stuff. The amount of communication that is displayed by way of body language and where we shift our eyes and faces always been interesting along with NLP. And we've had uh, discussions about that as well. And things that people say and where those things come from is intriguing. So I uh, absolutely agree. And folks, uh, pick that up, do a deep dive into it. And not only from a negotiation standpoint, but just try it on your family. <laughs> Yeah, it'll make your home life go better and make your negotiations go better. Just people around you in general, you can kind of understand like where they're coming from. And if they're having a bad day before you, you know, make a joke or something like that, it just it's really can make your life so much easier. Yeah. And it is all about relationships. So appreciate that tip, Ryan. Well, Ryan, always good to chat with you and catch up and I'm looking forward to our next round and our next interview. And we'll continue to keep everyone here abreast of what is going on on the block, all things on blockchain, as well as store tokens. Again, thanks, Ryan. Appreciate your time. Absolutely, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Hey, gang. Wait. Three things before you leave. First, don't forget to subscribe to the Self Storage Podcast and turn on your notifications so you never miss another episode. And while you're there, please leave us a five-star review if you like the show. Second, be sure to share your favorite episodes and more via Instagram and don't forget to tag us. And lastly, head to the links in the show description and hit the following subscribe button on Twitter and Facebook to get a front row seat as we grow and scale our business and bring you along with us. Take care.